Well, I want to welcome everyone for to joining us today. Uh, we are very happy to have you and this distinguished panel here at the R Street Institute. My name is Jonathan Coppage, and I direct the Urbanism Initiative here at R Street. Um, and we'll be moderating this murder's row. <laughs> um, so, eternal reminder, please check your cell phones to make sure that they are on, um, you know, the highest level of vibrate. And, all right, so shall we begin? Um, you should have gotten, when you came in, a couple of the magazines that co-published an excellent article by Chris on looking at walkable urban infrastructure and taking a very pragmatic, level-headed look at what are some of the ways in which both sides of a political arena are going to have to compromise and how they may be able to get to a place that actually makes sense for the wide variety of American communities and how they are built. So uh, we are going to start off just asking Chris to help us and walk through that process. Let me, so just a brief moment of introduction. Uh, Christopher Leinberger is a land use strategist, teacher, developer, researcher, and author, balancing business realities with social environmental concerns. Mr. Leinberger is the Charles Bendit Scholar, Distinguished Scholar and Research Professor and chair of the Center for Real Estate and Urban Analysis at the George Washington University School of Business. He is a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program in Washington, DC. Finally, he is a founding partner in Arcadia Land Company, a new urbanism and transit-oriented development firm based in Philadelphia. His most recent book is The Option of Urbanism, Investing in a New American Dream, He's an op-ed contributor to the New York Times, writes regularly for the Atlantic Monthly and numerous other magazines, CNN, NPR, Atlantic Cities, Washington Post, among others, have profiled him. So without further ado, Chris, please take it Great. away. Great to be here. Great to chat about this particular piece and the fact that this country may actually get some infrastructure spending. Uh, of course, don't hold your breath, but at least we're talking about it. Um, relevant background that really applies to this particular article is that for 20 years I owned and ran the country's largest real estate uh, consulting firm doing anywhere from four to 500 market studies throughout the year uh, for various developers and public bodies. The thing is, what that taught me is two things. One is, don't mess with mother nature. Yeah. And number two, don't mess with father market that Mother Nature and Father Market are going to get what they want. So everything that we're talking about here is, in essence, already happening. We're seeing this on the ground. And these market trends that I'm going to lay out and the policy recommendations that are in the article really are going to happen whether Washington gets in the game or not. It would just be a lot nicer if we lined up federal policy with what's going on at the local level. Because at the local level, there's almost no politics. It's really a, just a delight to work with the most conservative mayors or the most liberal mayors, and you're talking about how to redevelop their cities or their, or their suburban town centers, and there's no fight. It's just, how do we get this done? So hopefully we can have that same kind of conversation both here and, more importantly, on the Hill. So this starts also with a premise that transportation drives economic development. It's the most important infrastructure category, and that it is, so what we're trying to do is obviously come up with an infrastructure policy for the early 21st century. What are we talking about as far as size? We're talking about the largest asset class in the entire economy. If you took all of the real estate and all the infrastructure and looked at how much it's valued at, it's a mere 35% of the wealth of the country. It is twice the size of all the capitalized companies on the New York Stock Exchange or on NASDAQ two times. That's why we in real estate are very proud of the fact of the last three recessions, we've caused two of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, why we're also, I feel, bumping along at 2% growth in, in this country when we need to be at three or four, one of the major reasons, not the only reason, is this, this industry is not fully engaged right now because we haven't figured out this structural change that I'm going to talk about today 
and we haven't put in the right infrastructure to allow it to happen. So obviously, after these after these articles were written, the uh, the civil engineers came out with their 2017 uh, report card. In the articles, I talked about the 2013 because the 2017 wasn't out yet. And the surface transportation, what we're talking about today, as always, gets lousy marks. Bridges get the best, a C plus, though the average age of bridges are 43 years. I think it's just the sheer fear of falling off a bridge that gets people to at least put some money into them. Roads get a D. And by the way, rebuilding all these freeways that we built over the last 40, 50 years, they're all coming to the end of their, of their, of their useful life. It's going to cost two to three times more in real dollar terms what it costs to build them in the first place. Remember, we have to build them lane by lane at night and on weekends as we have tens of thousands of cars go by. Um, and, but many of these freeways, by the way, are going to be converted to boulevards, <coughs> such as the Whitehurst. Get rid of the Whitehurst. Stupid freeway. But there's all sorts of freeways that are going to go down. Transit gets a D minus, the lowest grade of the 16 different infrastructure categories. And even though the ridership is up 33% over the last two decades, and but we're seeing it flatten and begin to decline these last couple years. Don't quite know the reasons, but obviously it varies town by town. Poor performance here in DC. Um, the rise of you know the rise of a car share. We don't know the reasons for it, but we this is not a good thing. Um, we need to double the investment that's committed to just bring the surface transportation up to standard, much less improve it. And that means we need over a trillion dollars of investment just in surface transportation. And why is this important? Again, it's the transportation drives development. It's the fundamental reason that our economy really moves, literally and, and figuratively. And it's the reason, for instance, we have a Secretary of Transportation at the federal and state levels. We don't have Secretaries of Sewer. Um, so this, this issue of the surface transportation being so important, there are only two ways of building the built environment. There's drivable suburban, low density, isolated uses, all connected just by cars and trucks. There's no other transportation system that works. Well, we've been doing that for the last 60 years. That's, that's the only model we've been following. And we put in one transportation system to deliver what the market wanted in the late 20th century, which was drivable suburban development. Housing's over here, retail's over here, offices over here, industrial's over there, and the only way to get around is by cars and trucks. To build what the market is now demanding, as I'll show you, walkable urban, which is much higher density, many ways to get there, bicycles, cars and trucks, rail transit, walking, segways, uh, skateboards, but once you're there, it's walkable, much higher density, mix of uses, uh, a density that's 10, 20, 30 times more dense than drivable suburban. So those are the two options. The thing that we don't understand in this country very well about why we build transportation, and Rob knows this because he's been around transportation forever, is you know, so, so the corollary of transportation drives development is you don't build transportation systems to move people and freight. That's not why you build them. You build transportation systems with a goal of economic development. The means is by moving people and freight. So let me show you some of the market research that just proves that there's pent up demand for this walkable urban development, uh, this way of building that we've not been building for 50, 60 years. We did a study at GW of the largest 30 metros looking at their, we ranked them based upon their walkable urbanism. And the first thing we want to know as good real estate developers is are they getting a rent premium? And walkable urban space in these 30 metros, on average, get a 72% rent per square foot premium over drivable suburban. That's the market saying, build more of this stuff. We're going to pay you for it. It's 90% you know, for office, 71% for retail, 66% premium for multifamily rental. And all 30 metros now have a walkable urban premium. We've not seen that before. That's just talking that the pendulum swinging back, demanding walkable urban development. 
those premiums have all grown during this real estate cycle from 2010 to uh, today. So it continues to widen, hasn't leveled off yet. It will at some point, but it hasn't yet. And finally, all 30 metro areas are seeing the market share of walkable urban stuff expand at the expense of drivable suburban. It's expanding so fast that it reminds me of the 1980s when drivable uh, a suburban was expanding, walkable urban was collapsing, only reversed. We're seeing two and three times gains in market share for walkable urban over drivable suburban and in spite of those, those major premiums. The other thing it drives is the GDP of these metro areas. These 30 metros, those six metro areas on the right that are in green, they have the highest GDP per capita in the entire country. They're the most walkable. They have a $72,000 per year GDP per capita. This is Washington and Seattle and San Francisco and Boston and New York and uh, Chicago. You compare them to the least walkable urban, the Seattle or the um, Tampas and the Orlandos and the Phoenixes, they only have a $48,000 per year GDP per capita. That's a 49% premium. That's the difference between a first world and second world country. That's the difference between Germany and Russia, Romania, and Croatia, those, those fast growing economies on the Eastern fringe. So we've also looked at Metropolitan New York, and this is stuff that we're gonna be releasing up at the World Trade Center in two weeks. And it's Metropolitan New York is obviously the most walkable place in the country. 23 million people, 19 billion square feet, $6 trillion of real estate value. This is the first time this stuff has ever been calculated, the first census of a metro region. 31% of the square footage is walkable urban, but 47% of the valuation of all that real estate is walkable urban, but it only occupies 2.5% of the metropolitan area. That's it. Only 2.5% is where the future of the economic growth of Metro New York is going. The walkable urban space has a 150% price or valuation premium. You're willing to pay two and a half times more per square foot for a walkable urban office retail uh, house than for drivable suburban. Again, the market's saying we're willing to pay you so much more for this stuff. And think about the fact that 25 years ago, drivable suburban was worth more on a price per square foot basis. And the absorption is off the charts. 90% of the new space absorbed in this real estate cycle is walkable urban. Only 10% is drivable suburban. So the office market is tanking. Business parks are tanking up in northern New Jersey, out on Long Island. Um, and even industrial, which tends to be drivable suburban by nature, there's more walkable urban absorption of industrial. So this is the maker space. This is Williamsburg. This is the, this is the Navy Yard in, in Brooklyn. Is out absorbing industrial that's low density truck served. And it is driving valuation and it's driving GDP per capita. So the red dots are all the drivable suburban places in the metropolitan area. There's about 300 of them. The green dots are the walkable urban places. Uh, there's 149 of those. On the bottom down here, you're seeing the walk score. How many of you know what walk score is? Okay, only about 40% of you. Very important to know walk score. It's one of the best indicators of where we're going as a country zero to 100 ranking system. If you're a zero walk score at your house or at your office, it means you have to drive everywhere. You have to drive to go to the bathroom. Yeah. If you're above 70 walk score, you can walk to most places. So the drivable suburban is all scattered <laughs> in this, and, and then the, the left-hand uh, matrix is the economic index. I don't want to go into that, but it's GDP per capita, it's valuation. And you can see that it's all kind of in the middle, no real trend until you get to 70. And then this is where the walkable urban places start and then they shoot up as far as economic value. Every one walk score point above 70 
will increase the value of your real estate by $14 per square foot. Every one walk score point above 70 increases the per job GDP per capita by almost $700. This is a very serious economic impact. Now, you always, you might say, but what about displacement? What about gentrification? Well, we thought it used to be this, that economic, this is, a, this is an old slide about three years ago. Economic performance went up, social equity went down. It's not accurate. The new research is showing that in fact, the most walkable urban places with these premiums have the most social equity. It's counterintuitive, but here's New York. So here are the, are the two categories of walkable urban places and the amount that a 50% of area median income household. So this is somebody in New York making $32,000 per year in the household. Probably a single, you know, visualize a single mother, two kids, $32,000 per year living in, in New York. The percent of the money uh, of their household income they're spending on housing, which is in green, is less than the drivable suburban places. It's shocking, really surprising. And we always have known that the amount that they'll spend on transportation is less because they don't need cars. Cars are the second highest category of household spending. But we've never seen it that, that, that the housing was actually less. We think the reason for that is that New York City has had a very aggressive affordable housing program for decades. And this is showing up in the data and might also be the uh, rent regulations. And so we also see walk score versus social equity. Here's social equity on the left. Here's walk score again on the right. And above 70, the social <laughs> equity begins to take off. This is, again, counterintuitive. We did not expect this. So let me talk about the three policy changes that I recommend in this report to take advantage of what the market is saying. One is, is that we've got to get rid of top-down federal and state mandates. Right now, the federal transportation law that Christopher Coase was very much involved in getting uh, the new version of it passed <laughs> last year. Um, and the, bad stuff. <laughs> the good stuff. And that it's basically the old formula. It's the same old, same old as far as the basic transportation bill, which is that 80% of transportation dollars will go to roads. 20% will go to alternative transportation. That's the official term. Alternative, for all you hippies, is um, you know, transit, biking, walking, anything that was before the car is considered alternative. So 20% at best goes there, 80% goes towards roads. Get rid of the mandates that let the market have what it wants. And you do that by pushing the decision making as low down, as far down the government and governance spectrum as possible. Let the locals make these decisions and let them make them based upon what they know best about their local metropolitan area, their local city. And it could be rebuilding roads, it could be building new transit, it could be whatever they want. But then finally, use existing low cost federal loan programs that Christopher had a very serious uh, impact on in last year's transportation bill to borrow low cost federal monies to pay for it. Now, maybe there might be some federal grant money that might come along with it, but you know, kind of in your dreams, right? There, there, yesterday, one of the uh, congressmen did uh, suggest a increase in the gas tax, but again, don't hold your breath. Um, so I'm hoping it's gonna be sort of one third feds grant, one third paid for by local government. And generally, this means a sales tax increase. There have been uh, hundreds of ballot measures on the ballot over the last 15 years to raise money for rail transportation and bus improvements. Hundreds of them. 72% of them have passed. This last year, the biggest one to pass ever was Los Angeles. They raised their sales tax by a half cent over the next 40 years. And they have raised, they have now committed $120 billion for rail transit and bus rapid transit. So if they can do it, anybody can do it. And they're just going full bore 
to put in place, put back in place, what used to be there. You probably don't know in 1945 that um, Los Angeles had the longest rail transportation system in the world. By 1962, it was gone. They're putting it back in, and they've raised the money for it. Then the other third of the repayment needs to come from real estate developers. We have to have skin in the game as well. And this is beginning to, now this happens abroad all the time. It's beginning to happen here. The New York, uh, the um, a New York Avenue a metro station, one third of that was paid for by property owners around the station. And my friends that put up, each of them, $5 million each for, for their share, said best investment they've ever made. And basically we have to get back and learn from what the ancients taught us. A hundred years ago, virtually all the rail transit, about 80%, was paid for by real estate developers. My favorite story is here in town that Senator Newlands in the 1890s was a robber baron from, from uh, Nevada, comes back as senator. He, of course, bought the, the uh, seat and uh, had, didn't have much to do up on Capitol Hill. So he bought 1,800 acres in the northwest of D.C. from DuPont out to Chevy Chase. He named Chevy Chase. It's a Chevy Chase land company. So he was president of that. Then he was president of the newly formed Rock Creek Railway that went out Connecticut Avenue to get his customers out to his land. Now, the transportation model for transit then and now is the same. It loses money. So why did he do it? And how did he do it, more importantly? He had the profits from the, from the land subsidize the rail. Once he sold the land off, he dumped the rail transit. It got rolled up into what today we call WMATA. Uh, they bought up, you know, they consolidated all these losing railroads and uh, turned it into a regional agency. It's a story that's happened throughout the country. So we have to get back and learn from the ancients that real estate developers need to be part of the repayment mechanism. So three tactical changes. One is, is that liberals, we've got to streamline NEPA and other environmental uh, processes. This is a ridiculous, it's gotten so out of control. I was having dinner with the head of Sound Transit out in Seattle about three years ago. They're putting an 18 mile light rail to the east side of town. And I said, so when's it gonna be done? And she said, 2025. I looked at my watch and I said, what time zone are you in? This is mad. Um, think about all the, all the pollutants. Think about all the real estate that's not built, that's walkable urban around those stations waiting for all this processing. Um, the other thing is, is that conservatives must understand that this, there has to be more affordable housing built around these walkable urban places. Even though what I told you is that walkable urban is the most socially equitable, still the rent's too high. That, that household that I mentioned in New York is paying 40, 50% of their household income for rent. It should be no more than 30%. So we need to still engage in a very aggressive affordable housing program. And finally, we obviously have to be open to new technologies, welcome new technologies. And that's going to fundamentally change transportation, you know, shared rides, uh, automated cars, all the rest. Um, we have to welcome those. So what I've just mentioned here is that the, the, the future of development in, in this country is walkable urban. The feds can play a beneficial role or not, but either way, it's going to come. It's happening right now in Los Angeles, in Phoenix, in Denver, in Seattle, in Atlanta, in Miami. It's happening. And it's, it's just about time that the feds catch up with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, we will now give uh, each of our distinguished panelists uh, a few minutes to respond, and then we'll hopefully have what I expect to be a very productive conversation. So um, allow me to just uh, have Chris kick us, Christopher, Christopher kick us off. Uh, Christopher Coase is the Vice President of Real Estate Policy and External Affairs at Smart Growth America. Under his leadership, he oversees SGA's real estate programs, including LOCUS, 
uh, real responsible real estate developers and investors and TOD Finance and Advisors Inc., a for-profit subsidiary of Smart Growth America. Mr. Coase has led Locus and Smart Growth America's national and regional public policy and advocacy efforts on a range of issues, including securing over $20 billion in transit-oriented development and local infrastructure financing in the recent federal transportation legislation, the FAST Act. So Christopher, would you like to take a few minutes to give your thoughts? Sure. Um, first, hello everyone. How are you feeling? Great. Come on guys, how are you feeling? <laughs> Good. Um, I just wanna say thank you to Arshri and Chris Leinberger for this invitation to uh, speak with you guys today, to share my thoughts. Um, Chris Leinberger, just so folks know, was my former boss just about six months ago, and so I'll say- can really let me have it I now. can let it have it now. <laughs> um, but I think the, the statement I will always say is, generally, I do not like to follow Chris Leinberger. Uh, it always leads to a bad situation. Um, so with that, uh, let me go right at it. Um, so for a couple uh, key points I wanna highlight. Um, I generally do not disagree with Chris Leinberger in the context that he framed this. I think it's very important for us to take a step back and ask ourselves a very simple question. Where in the hell are we going as a country and as a world? What is working, what is not working, and how in the hell do we make sure we as a country are doing better than everyone else? If we can start at that very fundamental premise, then we can have a very honest conversation about how do we get there faster. And I think, Chris, your point and your characterization where the real estate market uh, really was very, very detailed, but I bring it back to the human level. I think it's very clear as someone who works with real estate development companies who are working every day with local communities to do one thing, create great and amazing places where people can live, have a great quality of life, where they can raise their children to have a brighter future. I think we all agree is that's what we're trying to do here on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we can make some money at it, that's a great thing. One of the things that I think you touch upon, Chris, in your recommendation is that uh, there is a conversation we need to have about the role that the federal government should have in infrastructure. Um, when Donald, uh, President uh, Trump made the announcement about $1 trillion, trillion, everyone got excited and a lot of people were upset about it. Um, and one of the first things, my reactions to this conversation about should we spend a $1 trillion package? Um, I think it's very clear one of the lessons that we as a country uh, had to face in 2008 um, during the economic calamity was that we were spending a lot of money that did not have performance measures tied to it accountability tied to it, and a lot, as you pointed out, a lot of the money was coming from the federal government. We were building a lot of things that turns out wasn't working. And I asked a very fundamental question. Are we ensuring any dollar that comes was from the federal government all the way down to the local level? Is it accountable? And does it have, and is it tied to performance metrics? Before we have a conversation on what we should do, we should make sure th those fundamentals are in place. Uh, the second thing I wanna highlight is um, I firmly believe this is the moment where we can make federal government be a partner and not more say the determinant of what happens on the ground. Communities across the country are literally asking, not for a handout, but for a partner. Um, there are a number of projects that I've been working in in a lot of uh, suburban and rural communities where they simply just need the federal government to provide them best practices. What are other communities doing to accelerate economic development around their rural town center? What are other communities doing to make sure that we don't make the mistakes on trans um, development? In addition to that, in the real estate community, one of the biggest challenges to make what you call walkable urban development happen is actually paying for the public infrastructure. And we are seeing in a lot of places, when you build walkable urban development correctly, you can actually create value. How can we create a framework, whether at the federal level, state and local, where we can capture that value and put it back into the infrastructure? Because right now, what we're talking about with a $1 trillion budget or proposal is to build new stuff. But no one's talking about how do you actually maintain it after you build it? And that's the conversation we need to be having. The third point I think I wanna highlight from this conversation um, you spoke about this, uh, the need of affordability or social uh, conscious uh, affordable housing uh, policy. This market, this walkable urban market is accelerating fairly quickly. It's also creating things in real time that government doesn't respond to very well. 
you literally are having landowners who are noticing new development three blocks away go up and say, oh, I used to charge $600 for rent. I'm just using DC market for those of us who are in the area. And noticing, oh, there's a new streetcar on A Street. Now I can maybe charge double. Well, you had this tenant for 10 to 20 years. There's nothing wrong for the landowners. You know, that's their right. But the question is, why didn't the local government, why didn't the redevelopment authority actually think and ask if we made these investments, we know what the market is going to do. What can we do in place to incentivize or disincentivize bad behavior in the market? Government doesn't operate like that. Should it? I think the answer to that is yes. And maybe it doesn't need to be the lead, but maybe we need to create things like you guys are very familiar with business improvement districts, right? Place-based strategies. How do you enhance economic? Well, why are we not having that same conversation on the social equity? Well, you have someone on the ground, day in, day out, quarterbacking these issues at a much quicker rate than someone who's sitting behind a desk who may not come to that neighborhood but once a year. That's something that we need to talk about. Um, I think your point about localizing is a very big one. Um, local control, in my opinion, is where we should be headed. Federal government should be incentivizing what's happening at the local level. Now, if you know anything about federal investments, oftentimes these dollars come to the state DOT, where the state secret DOT secretary actually now sits back and decides who gets what. Not the mayor, not the city council officials, but they have to go up to the state DOT and beg for those dollars to come down to the local level. We need to get the dollars where the people are and where the businesses are. And those decisions have to get there as well. Um, I generally believe that this next package that's being debated has to encompass those principles. Um, but I want to leave here with a, uh, a quote that was just sent to me. And that's why I was searching while you were speaking. And I, and I just want to leave it because I think it really summarized what we really want to achieve here. And that is, let's build our communities in a way that makes the most sense by examining the full costs, return on investment, and sustainability of our growth patterns. Instead of solely looking to expand our cities outward with expensive, new expensive infrastructure, we can invest in restoring and rebuilding the neighborhoods, downtowns, and main street communities we already have. When we fully utilize our existing infrastructure, we reduce government spending and help create the environment for businesses to compete, grow, and prosper. Can anyone tell me who gave that quote? Actually, Governor of North Dakota, Doug Bergen. This, what I'm really emphasizing is that this is not a liberal issue. This is not a right-wing issue. This actually, if you invest in existing communities and walkable urban development, it's physically prudent, and it does all the other things that the left likes. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Great. Good stuff. Thank you. And now we will turn to Robert Puentes, who is the president and CEO of the Eno Center for Transportation, a nonprofit think tank with the mission of improving transportation policy and leadership. Prior to joining Elo, he was a senior fellow at Brookings, and um, where he directed the program's Metropolitan Infrastructure Initiative. He is currently a non-resident senior fellow with Brookings, and prior to joining them, he was the director of infrastructure programs at the Intelligent Transportation Society of America. He's a frequent speaker to a variety of groups, a regular contributor in newspapers and other media, and has testified before congressional committees. So Robert, what do you think? Oh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, and you think it's hard following Chris? Should try following you for a change. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, the issue, the infrastructure issue, I've been in this for, for a number of years. It's clearly been pushed kind of closer to the front burner of the policy discourse. No matter who was elected in November, we knew there was going to be some emphasis on infrastructure. Um, this isn't something that both campaigns came up with by themselves because they thought it was brilliant ideas. They were hearing this from cities and states and metropolitan areas, public and private officials all across the country. And so this is something that is a, a, a conversation that's a long time coming. Um, but let me, let me relate the conversation that we're having today and, and, and particularly Chris's uh, presentation to three big issues I think that are circling around the infrastructure conversation in the U.S. today, particularly since uh, the new administration's come out with some proposals back in, you know, since, since November. Um, we don't have a whole lot now. It's still a bit of a blueprint and it's still kind of reading the tea leaves, but I think we know a little bit of where, where they're starting to go. 
The one is uh, this issue around around deconstructing government, particularly when it comes to transportation. And I think the skinny budget that came out two week two weeks ago last mm -hmm. week, two, two weeks ago, ago um, kind of started to hint to that. This is trying to figure out how do we get government out of different areas of public policy, particularly on uh, on transportation. And it relates exactly to what Chris said, and, and I don't really know exactly how to get to this yet, but the point Chris was trying to make is that there's government is all up involved in a lot of infrastructure decisions right now, and it's not a free market. And the, the, the market is looking for something very different than what public policy is starting to deliver. It's a very unlevel playing field when it comes to how the federal government chooses between highways, transit, bridges, things like that. Um, there's a heavy emphasis on on, on highways, much less emphasis on transit. And I think you're exactly right. I would love to see there be a market approach to a lot of these different modes of infrastructure. I think that we're seeing the demand for these kinds of modes for infrastructure out there. And if we got the government out a little bit more and let localities make decisions based on the, the, the investments they want to make, I think we'd see a very different product on the ground. Um, we see it in, in place after place. The other thing you mentioned that I didn't have in my notes, um, but I think is very important, is around procurement reform. And there's nothing that puts people to sleep more than talking about procurement reform. <laughs> not an exciting topic. But it really, really matters because it, it, it determines the ways that things get done and how places choose investments that they make, how they work with different actors. Um, and the system, as Chris said, is just fundamentally broken. It should not take eight years to get these projects to 18 years. Um, it's bananas. So we've got to spend some time and pull out the wires of that system and put it back together again in a form that works for what we need right now. You can even say that all these rules, fine, were in place because we're trying to avoid fraud, waste, and abuse. Okay, that's fine. But now we need something that matters um, for the realities we're facing uh, today. That leads to the second point around public-private partnerships. This keeps coming up a lot with the new administration, um, a lot of the emphasis on giving tax credits to private investors or however that's going to come out. But the issue of the public and the private sector working together has been amplified. And I think a lot of people default to things like toll roads. They say, well, toll road is something we can invest in. It's a public asset. The private sector is interested in it because it has rate payers. That's kind of what we're talking about. But I think what Chris highlighted, and Christopher also as well, is that this really is like true partnerships. And the way that we're getting things developed now and built is this true um, – combinations of public and private nonprofit sectors working together to build out our communities. And it's not just in things like, again, like toll roads or water systems, but real estate and development is the quintessential version um, of a public-private partnership. If you're building these, these, um, these transit lines, these train stations, as Chris was saying, you've got to then couple that with conversations about then what's the, what's the, the private sector role here? How can they work together? How can they leverage these investments so we can get the best bang out of the buck. I love the line about having skin in the game. It's exactly what we need um, for this new approach in the future. And then the third thing, well, I mean, I'm still on the, on, the, on the private part, is there is something also that's changing around technology and all these new players that are in transportation um, and the lifts and the Ubers and the, the bridges that are providing transit services and car to go, providing car sharing. There's the, the private sector role in transportation provision is completely upending, I think, our models of how we deliver services in cities and urban areas. That's a great example also, I think, of, of public-private partnerships. So the last thing is, uh, and I don't quite know how to talk about this yet, but I'm starting to figure out um, the, 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 the nuances of it, and it's what Chris was saying, it's about the definition of infrastructure. And that's not just something a wonky think tank person would care about, but we actually need to figure that out because when we talk about infrastructure and we frame it around roads, bridges, and transit, well, yeah, that's one thing. And you expand it and you start talking about, well, about telecommunications. What about energy? Now I think it's schools and hospitals are part of that. And what about real estate? Is that part of it? And I think we actually have to have that broad, encompassing definition about infrastructure um, that includes the built environment broadly, another unsexy term that puts people to sleep. But it means the stuff that we've built all over the place. Some of it's delivered by the public sector in a traditional way. Some of it's delivered by the private sector. Some of it's always going to be delivered by the private sector. Energy, telecom, and real estate is a great example. And so it matters. The definition matters because those different sectors are all designed and governed and financed and delivered very, very differently. So if we're trying to figure out what we want as a country, if we're trying to figure out what the federal response would be, you've got to be that specific about what sector are you talking about because it's going to dictate what the public role is going to be, what the private role is going to be, and how that plays out up and down uh, the federalist chain. So. 
I, I really like the article. I think that it was, I, I think it was very smart to have it in two different publications because infrastructure has always been not just bipartisan, but nonpartisan. And I think we're seeing that very clearly here in the first couple of months of this year. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. And uh, to ramp up this portion, we will turn to Salim Firth, who researches and explains how public policy affects economic growth and individual opportunity as a research fellow in macroeconomics at the Heritage Foundation's Center for Data Analysis. His economic research has covered fiscal policy, international economics, labor market trends, and economic mobility. His commentary has appeared in The Federalist, The City, The Washington Times, and he was a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal's policy blog, Think Tank. Before joining Heritage in 2012, he was a visiting assistant professor of economics at Amherst College and a visiting research scholar at Northeastern. So, Salim. Yes. Well, thank you for having me, John. Um, I, uh, I'm a macroeconomist. I'm not a, I'm not a transportation person. I know significantly less about transportation and real estate than anyone else on this stage. Um, so. I'll stick to what I think actually my real comparative advantage is here, um, which is kind of coming from conservative world and into a topic that's that's quite dominated by uh, the center left to left and saying, all right, these are things you want. And I'm a, a city lover myself. I, I want a lot of the same things to be built. I, I love living on Capitol Hill. Um, how can you get what you want from a political system that's dominated by the other party? And that is, that's not going to change anytime soon. You're probably not going to have unitary, um, you know, Democratic Party governance um, in, in the you know, short foreseeable, especially if we're talking about this particular bill. This is going to be driven by what Republican lawmakers want, and they'll grab a few Democratic senators um, from purplish states as needed, right? So that's, that's where we are politically. Um, you're probably not going to convince these politicians to do um, – you know, kind of a, a, a list of priorities from the other party. How do we get what we want uh, from a political system that isn't lined up for to deliver that? So, um, Chris, in his uh, article, which was really, really cleverly, I, I love the the publication in two two journals. That was really clever. Um, so he listed three priorities: um, don't play favorites, move decisions closer to voters, and make sure localities have skin in the game. Um, I like those for two reasons. One is that there's a harmony between them, so you're not giving me three priorities that are natural trade-offs to each other. Um, and the other reason I love them is that they comport very nicely with the Heritage Foundation's main goal for transportation policy, uh, which is to devolve it to the states. Um, with you know maybe a few exceptions, you've got some you know actually interstate bridges uh, where there's a clear federal role. But uh, what we would like to see is the gas tax in its entirety or almost its entirety um, kicked down to the state level and then let the states decide. Um, and this is a few potential benefits. One is, and people haven't mentioned this, but there's a cost crisis in infrastructure in the US. We pay substantially more than other developed economies for the same uh, kilometer of subway or the same bridge. It's physically the same, but we're paying more. Um, no matter where you stand, right? This is nonpartisan. We want to get these for a little less. It's not exactly no matter where you stand, because there are clearly, this money is going to someone. And cutting the feds out and just kicking everything down a level removes one layer in this cake. And so there's just like one layer of frosting less that you've got to slather into the funding. Um, and, you know, in economics, we call this something like a principal agent problem. So somebody at the top wants something done. They ask somebody to do it for them. So you've got this multi-layered. The cities come to the state with their proposals. The states pick the, you know, sexiest looking ones and take that to the feds. Um, and the result is that you get a very political process of what gets funded. Um, and that's playing favorites. So I think we really, with, a, with kicking it down to the state level, we're really going to address that playing favorites issue. Um, and it clearly you know, moves things closer to the voters, et cetera. Um, to get the, the kind of transportation that makes walkable urban spaces work, um, I don't think you're going to see that happen through uh, a lot of elected, nationally elected Republicans. Um, there are, in, in the GOP, there are sort of what I would call cosmopolitan conservatives and parochial conservatives. And I, I don't mean that to be um, either term to be, to be uh, insulting. Um, I'm more of a cosmopolitan myself, globalist, you know, uh, happily believe in free trade. 
Um, we're seeing in the Trump administration the ascendancy of the more parochial interests, people who, you know, largely are really concerned with what affects their own life. And if you're talking to the typical GOP voter, especially GOP primary voter, they do not care about subways. They don't like cities, right? They go to New York once every couple of years to see a Broadway show and stay in a nice hotel. Um, they might like some walkable main streets, uh, John. Um, even in Texas, seven of the 10 most populous counties voted for Clinton this time around. Every one of the major cities in Texas voted for Clinton. Um, there are very few red cities. Se sure, I'm not sure if this is on actually. Um, seven of the 10 most populous counties in Texas voted for Clinton uh, and all of the major cities in Texas. So um, conservatives are never going to get on board with more funding for transit or bikes uh, or Main Street improvements. That's never going to be um, our ball game. Uh, it doesn't help their voters who don't live in those places, largely. Um, and it would be, from a federalism perspective, un, you know, it would be um, unprincipled. So conservatives believe that things should be moved to the lowest level of government that's competent to handle them. Um, in this particular case, as an economist, I can also say this comports with economic theory. So the idea of a public good, right, is that something doesn't naturally happen in the private sector because of uh, some sort of externality. Um, and so the government comes in and provides this public good that wouldn't be well provided by the public sector, the private sector. But when you nationalize something that's fundamentally local, you're actually creating rather than fixing externality, right? So when taxpayers in Iowa and Alaska are paying for subways, or when people all over the country are paying for the highway in my district, we have actually gone out and created a new externality. Uh, moving funding closer to the people who are enjoying the benefits solves that externality, as well as the kind of the original um, private actors don't build enough transportation one. Um, so devolution is, is, to me, that is the core or the, the best way to get anti-urban GOP national politicians to support spending on urban priorities. It says, Connecticut, if you love cities and you want to build more uh, transportation, go for it. You're a blue state. Do what you want. It's your money. Rhode Island, you want to you know, improve Providence's um, transportation system, it's your money. Do what you want with it. Um, you know, Bill Schuster's transportation committee is never going to be making great decisions for Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and then lastly, since, uh, you know, this is, a, again, a space where I get to talk to uh, Democrats, there's a lot of things that Democrats can fix on their own. Um, the cities are basically blue spaces, and there's a lot of urban policy that's decided even below the state level. Ease zoning. Um, Keep the transit unions in check. Uh, too often, transit systems become a jobs program. And the people who are driving the trains are making more money than the typical person taking the train. So if you're raising fares to pay the transit union workers more, you're increasing inequality. Um, and then getting creative with value capture and, and um, you know all the ways that you guys are involved are, are tremendous to hear about. Um, finding ways in a 21st century economy to get private skin in the game, get that land value um, plowed into transit, improvements like bike lanes that, that make it more pleasant, but don't, you know, it's very hard to charge a toll on a bike lane. Um, I wish we could just toll the cars that use the bike lanes. <laughs> um, so, so those are things that I, you know, as a cosmopolitan conservative, I would love to see Democrats say, hey, We've lost all these national institutions, but boy, we've got all the major cities in the U.S. We can make these places that are attractive, beautiful, and that more Americans can live in because of decreased zoning and want to live in because of better amenities. So thank you for being here, and, and uh, um, thank you for letting me participate, John. Uh, thank you. And I'll just chime in here from uh, my perspective as Salim uh, brought up one of my hobby horses, which is the Main Street development, um, which is that we talk a lot about, and you know, especially with talk of infrastructure bills in the air, um, just the transportation side of how the federal government is involved in this. But it is important also to look at all of the ways in which federal policy has influenced and set the American uh, forms of built environment over the past really century or so. And um, even as the market has shifted, you know, shockingly, 
the governmental programs haven't necessarily shifted. And so you will find, if you dig into FHA or Fannie or Freddie, you will find a lot of organizations that see themselves as very oriented towards producing more and more of the uh, drivable suburban. And even when you have, and um, this is something that I encounter a decent amount, I'm sure uh, all of you have as well, um, mid-sized cities and small towns that are trying to reinvest in their downtown or their main street, trying to create an economically viable core so that they can attract a better workforce and everything like that. Um, there are significant obstacles that they run into uh, just getting that financed because so much of the uh, federal structures that have been set up to um, finance housing either you know it likes either very widespread uh, single family houses or it can do very tall suburban garden apartments but to do a more incremental form where you have you know as we've built a very dispersed environment um, to be able to perhaps repair to reform to allow uh, individual communities to um, you know make the changes to serve the demand that they see uh, we need to be looking at the full range of the federal involvement. Um, so now, why don't I just uh, kick it around and I'll participate somewhat. But uh, I, I think Salim got us to a really interesting point, uh, which is specifically uh, the feds and the states. Uh, Christopher, dive right in. Uh, Take I, us away. Uh, so... Uh, First, this is a really good conversation, and this is literally happening every day in state legislatures and on the federal, on, in the corridors of Congress and within the administration. Um, but I want to tell a little bit of truth here. Um, one, I think if we're really honest about how this game is actually played when it comes to infrastructure, there are winners and losers. And when there are suggestions about how to, quote unquote, devolve the process down to states, uh, one of the things that's lost in that conversation is something I mentioned before, is the state, i.e. the state DOT, the best person or agency right. to determine where those funds are. And no one's never seen, and I, I think that's a conversation that should be definitely discussed, because I think one can make the argument in those current states, those state DOTs are actually right now the custodians of the 80% of funds that are coming from the federal government, and look what's happened thus far. Uh, so from a conservative perspective, I think we should actually ourselves, ask ourselves, is there a level of government accountability in those institutions to actually, so maybe we need to skip the state and actually get it down to the voters, what we've seen. The second thing I, I, I want to highlight on is the conversation about the traditional Republican on Capitol Hill. Um, I also want to tell the truth. I've, I am not the blazing liberal Democrat on the stage. I've worked for a number of Republicans. I I, <laughs> um, and I will tell you that working with a coalition of real estate developers who are trying to create great places to live, yes, maybe uh, seven years ago when I started at Locust, it was a tall order. But I think what has, what has to be said in this context if you talk to someone like Secretary Heller, Dean Heller, who has a lot of rural in Nevada, if you talk to, to Lou Barletta from Pennsylvania, uh, who used to be the mayor of a small town, Hazleton, Pennsylvania, he will tell you, they will both tell you that when they go back home and they talk to their local chamber of commerce, they talk to their hospital or whoever their large employer, those individuals, those stakeholders who are actually creating jobs, creating a tax base, they're saying the same thing. We're having a hard time keeping educated young people in the area or attracting and retaining talent. That's the issue. What the hell do we do to bring them back? Saying to Walmart or to some big employer that we're going to give you massive tax credits and tax cuts to get you to locate your building here is not the economic model that these smaller town rural communities need or will be successful. So, the, 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 so I, I say that to say, in the past seven years, you're finding a lot of right-wing conservatives when you get the terms. You take transit out, okay, you, but you put mobility in, because guess what? Rural trends is a big deal. If you take out sustainability and livability, but you're talking about economic development, if you take out the language that maybe the left uses, but you actually use the language that they're accustomed to and they feel comfortable with, 
at the end of the day, I find myself having a conversation where I have Republicans and Democrats coming together on a bill that says, yes, we want to accelerate this type of development. But when I go back to my city or to my rural area, we're using our own language, but the same outcome is there. And the final thing I want to point out is um, one of the things that we have to be very careful on um, is, and I, I, I just throw this out for a conversation, actually. Um, if we really want to, what I thought was the uh, brilliance, brilliance of the $1 trillion discussion that Donald Trump put out on the table was that it was all done by the private sector. I loved it because we just two years ago passed a $300 billion bill out of Congress going down right now through the pipeline. So why not incentivize the and private sector? And that's $300 billion over five, five years. years. So why not get the side of the market that has the most capital to do what we wanted to do? I remember sitting in a meeting with a lot of progressive organizations, and they literally, and I'm probably one of the few private sector folks in the room, and literally they're like, there's no way we could get the private sector, you know, the idea that private sector is going to own the roads, the bridges, the da 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 that's bad, bad, bad. And I stopped and said, time out, guys. Is there a way to make the private sector to do the good things you want them to do and make it profitable? Isn't that really what we want? If you want them to do a development and improve your infrastructure and have great uh, housing options, I want to do. I want to see that happen. But let's figure out a way to create a tax structure that makes it profitable. Why is that so hard to do? And I think that's the opportunity that we have right now in this country to think it's not going to solve everything. But can we figure out a way to make the private sector do what it should do, but at the same time? Because if you don't make it profitable. No one's going to do it. Uh, so I, I put that as in terms of response, and hopefully I get some retort back. Uh, but I think we have to be very careful about the idea of rural versus urban versus suburban, because I think you have to take that out the window. At the end of the day, is, does it, is it actually physically responsible? Because you can build a lot of ex-urban places and actually not be able to pay the bill, says city council member or county commissioner. Um, but you also have a lot of trends. I think you brought up a lot of good points about financing transit and actually find out that we're not doing it efficiently. And I think we have to remove what those been those classic fire breeding, you know, radio talk hosts, you know, language and actually just get to numbers. Does it add up? And can the private sector make a dollar and can the public get some good out of it? Great. Uh, speaking of numbers, Robert, you are someone who is well versed in all of this. So in this discussion of the uh, potential role of private actors in stepping in, uh, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, again, I think it's it's I, I would like us to get away from just the private role as being partners on big projects like toll roads. Um, if we can get past that, I think we will have achieved a whole lot because it is changing, and, and the, the point of devolution I'm, um, is exactly right insofar as we've thought about it as this kind of pyramid with the federal government on the top kind of raining money down on states and localities, and, and you're right. I think we need to upset that model because it doesn't really exist right now. Um, it's the public and the private sector and the federal government and the states. They're all working together in different ways on different projects, and so – the, the problem that I have is that the, the conversation about infrastructure is so just way too simplistic, right? right. There's not, and I just try, I, I'm trying to get away from just the word infrastructure. There's no infrastructure. Well, there is, but <laughs> there's transit, and there's roads, there's bridges, there's electricity, there's telecommunications, all these different things. And that matters because then it gets to all the things we just talked about. Where is the private sector heavily involved? Energy, telecom, real estate, where are they not going to be that involved? Water, transportation, transit, you know, something. So once we get to that, I think we'll have a sharper understanding of what the policy response is that it should be. But the issue, of course, is getting it down as low as it can go so that people can make that right decision. Um, you know, here in D.C., talk, you know, talking about water, we're not talking about water in this article or, or on this panel, but, you know, we pay four or five times more for water than we did 10 years ago because we're making a massive investment in D.C. in that giant cavernous vault underneath the Anacostia to stop storm, storm water runoff with, with pollutants going into the uh, Potomac. And uh, that was a local decision. Rates went up. We're amortizing billions of dollars of bonds. And that was a local decision. And we should be able to allow that to take place with all types. And, but it means not giving the state DOTs, in the case of service transportation, the monopoly that the feds have now. Most state DOTs, in my experience, 
They used to call themselves Department of Highways. Yes. They're still Department of Highways. And it's still the highway bill that they talk about. That, you know, it's the same players with a, with, with a different name. And um, so that's why, to me, it's important to get it down as low as you can. And Christopher raised the point of down to business improvement districts. Business improvement districts are a new level of governance in our society. It's the fourth level, Fed, state, local. Place management is this emerging new field. It's the fastest growing political movement in the country that you've never heard of. And it is going to be implementing a lot of these, a lot of these investments. It's going to be a level of governance that is, you know, govern right now we're in between the downtown business improvement district and Golden Triangle. I'm not certain where the, whether you're in one or the other, but you're real close to, mm -hmm. to the line. And both of these combined have budgets of anywhere from eight to $12 million each annually, all private sector raised to, you know, they're running Farragut Park. They're going to redevelop Franklin Park. They have clean and safe teams. They have fe they run the Cherry Blossom Festival. They put in place the shuttle service, the um, the uh, the uh, DC circulator. Uh, circulator. Um, these this is the future of governance in our in our society. Let these folks, who have definite skin in the game, pay for and take responsibility for a lot of the infrastructure improvements that that we need. Yeah, and I want to chime in with that, um, with a great example of how state-level DOTs can, in fact, be an obstacle to devolution and local decision-making. Um, one of the great trends of late is um, a discovery of highway tear-outs and tear-downs mm -hmm. and yep. um, undoing some of the central planning that uh, – Washington, D.C. and others, uh, you know, the esteemed Robert Moses up in New York did over the years, which was to tear down actual organic neighborhoods in order to build highways because highways, don't you know, were the greatest. Um, and in Dallas, they did this with and carved through uh, their city separating downtown from South Dallas. Yes, yeah, South Dallas. I'm working on that right now. Indeed. Um, and they have everyone on board now, just about. You know, there's been a lot of political work, which I'm sure all of y'all know even better than I do, but um, they've gotten the political coalition to where they've convinced the right people. They've gotten the numbers there. You know, there are $4 billion in economic value that's under a road that does not need to be there. But there's. Uh, the Texas uh, regional manager who has the money and who has interests and who has to be brought in. And so um, it's very important, I think, for especially for conservatives who are interested in devolution, to take a full understanding of the ways in which um, these structures take place and so that um, you know, our street as an organization that works at the state level as well can get involved to try and get decisions being made at the right places to get the right people. Let me comment on that quickly, but, but, but I'd love to hear uh, a, a variety of comments. So we've always heard about the great debate about states' rights, and that's generally phrased of the feds versus the states. Well, the real states' rights battle in this country is the states versus the local governments. Local governments are a ward of state governments. They're empowered by the state constitutions. And in Texas, it's Austin basically telling Dallas, I'm sorry, you can't vote on those issues. I'm sorry, you can't raise taxes on those issues because we want the power in Austin. And it drives you crazy in a place like Texas that they have the state dictating top down this kind of stuff. So I'd love right. to hear. Yeah, I mean, we see this. This is. And I don't, I don't think the, the research agenda on why the U.S. is so expensive for infrastructure construction is done. It's a, one of the best research agendas ongoing in the U.S. right now. Um, but one of the theories, and I think it has merit, is that we have so many overlapping jurisdictions. So we saw this with the Second Avenue subway in New York, right? So you've got oh, Albany, the city, the various boroughs with their own interests within the city, 
then you've got the, the transit authority is its own separate thing, and PATH is its own separate thing, which might interact, and then the commuter rail lines which share the stations and who are going to be disrupted by um, construction, potentially. So you had a ridiculous number of stakeholders, um, and in order to get them all in the game, they kind of got to get paid, like, you know, maybe they, there's some extra work in it for them, um, or some kind of infrastructure improvement on their part of you know the 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 system there um and then you know we've we've got american cities where the the school district doesn't line up with the county or the city lines which from i'm i'm from new england so i'm used to towns like the town does everything um owns the roads uh and and the the water system the schools everything and there's a certain logic uh to the point that massachusetts has been able to abolish half of its counties um they are lines on a map you can still find those lines but there is no one on the payroll. There is no elected office. They either took their, they took their functions and they kicked it up, like jails they kicked up to the state and other things they kicked down to the towns. And they said, we don't need this structure. And you know, in a lot of cases, New York, I mean, looking at the mess that they have, they need to be agile on transportation and many other things. And 780 separate jurisdictions and yeah. that ignores all the mosquito abatement districts. And the <laughs> mosquito abatement districts? That's amazing. Um, That's on top of the 7 Yeah. So there's, so there's some level of consolidation that can be beneficial. I mean, that's consolidation is also, you know, something we should be nervous about for the same reasons that, that Chris originally stated, like you're moving things away from people, but at, this, at a certain point, government is no longer functional. And um, you know, business improvement districts are going to be another example of this. So say you have a uh, bid that wants to have a nice protected bike lane that's going to, um, you know, route commuters through and, and help people feel safe. Well, they don't own the streets. And maybe the businesses are all willing to say, yeah, we'll give up our parking to get this protected bike lane. But a church might not. The church might not. Right. And the city government might say, sorry. Or um, the state governments might say, hey, we're looking at these, um, you know, federal highway standards, which are essentially designed for green land, right? So you've got these huge, you know, widths on anything that's a federal highway. And sorry, this, this city street happens to have a route number on it. And we can't do anything, you know, you can't do anything without uh, the feds involved. So I, I completely agree with devolving further. Um, you know, it, it might be that at the local level, we're doing some mix of devolution and aggregation, but that's going to be really different state by state as to, you know, what type of mess they're in. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're getting to a point where we can also take some questions from the audience and keep this conversation going. So, um, Mike. Go, going back to the, thank you. Going back to the, uh, Chris, your observation about bids. And bids have come up a couple of times during the conversation. When we think about uh, uh, applying private capital or local capital to the issues that the discussion has been about, could the bid mechanism function over a broader geographic area than it currently does, and could it even be multi-jurisdictional? For instance, is your, specul your observation and speculation about bids, could Amtrak corridor projects be undertaken over the long term touch on by a bid like mechanism, a kind of a super federalism that addresses specific issues. Is that where your observation goes? The answer is yes. And Christopher will talk about the multiple bids coming together because there's a mechanism for that. But you know, the the DC circulator came out of a discussion between thanks. Between the downtown bid and the Georgetown bid, because you, we all know the story that Georgetown didn't get a metro for whatever reason. Uh, we can debate that. But they desperately want one now. And they'll get a gondola first, which <laughs> is actually a good idea, by the way. It, it's going to make money. <laughs> um, and uh, I would invest in, in good, that, actually. Please. <laughs> um, but, the, um, but the circulator was these two bids saying, we need a way to get get connected and then it just grew from there and there's a bid council here in dc of the uh, of the 10 11 bids that are in dc that are active in making sure that that circulator services their 
their their needs. So it's basically servicing most of the bids in town. It's and most people consider it the best bus system in town. So as, as far as you know, collectively pulling it together, thinking about RIF and other programs with U.S. DOT. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, well. I think there's a couple things when we talk about biz in this particular context it's essentially the ability for some organized group to tax themselves right and so in that space i wouldn't say bid i would say a tiff district right a tax increment and financing district and that is definitely something that uh, i think on the federal level actually where RIF and tiff these are popular uh uh federal loan programs actually serve very well where the federal government recognized that okay look you're trying to do the right thing you're trying to build your own Pay, you know, uh, raise your own funds, but clearly the funds are not there today. So we will take the risk since we have good credit and we have a lot. Of, we'll give you the money up front, as long as you meet certain reg regulations, so you can build the infrastructure. So you don't have to wait 20 years where you actually have the cash right hand. And we all know if you wait 20 years to build a road that's cost that $10 million, 20 years later, it's going to probably be twice that amount, right? So in that instance, yes, I think that is something that we're beginning to increasingly see. What I think uh, you actually asked, which is actually more innovative that we haven't heard. When have we ever seen uh, tax incremental financing districts cross city lines? We've seen that. You know, you actually have joint cooperation with counties or cities, but have they ever crossed state lines where then the federal government could in of itself create a federal TIF district of sorts, and we have not seen something like it because oftentimes these properties are owned by private sector or local, and therefore they had to enable themselves, right? The question is if there was federal owned land that crossed, yes, that could happen, but we haven't seen that because of those challenges. Um, but I think you do bring something to the table, which is we clearly need at the place level more nimble instruments to finance these infrastructure improvements. What I would suggest as a careful amendment is that what Rob has said before, when we think about infrastructure, we may need to start thinking broader beyond just uh, the streetcar or the street improvement, but also think about what is the th are the items of whether well, there's a hospital or a school that all need to be put into this, you know, category that should also, because what I'm hearing so far now <laughs> when I'm on the Hill and from a lot of groups, they say, hey, there are a lot of neighborhoods, Knoxville, Louisville, that are investing in streetcar light rail. They're taxing themselves. And these were old bastions of Republican thought. They already decided to do it themselves. But now it's going to displace not just people who can't live there, but affordable commercial space, right? So what do we do about that? Well, we hear there's a value capture thing, right? <laughs> oh, I have a school. We need new resources. I hear there's a value capture thing of this new economic Let's engine. Let's spend that money three Let's or four times <laughs> over. Yes. And then actually you realize everyone's trying to drink from a trough that yeah. slowly... And there's a moon shop that we have, so we, let's fund that. Um, and I think this really goes back to my initial point and my concern. Communities need, at the place level, at the state level, the federal government, we need to make priorities. And those priorities, in my view, should be aligned to how does it ensure that we create great places for us to raise our family, have good jobs, and beat Russia and China and all these other folks. That should be our priority. And therefore, you can then prioritize what gets the first wave of funds. And unfortunately, we have not had that conversation at the federal level. Sometimes you hear it at the state level, but we always hear it because there's always an election. Mayors are always getting feedback. City council members are always getting feedback. And that's where I want to see these discussions happen more often, tied to where, yes, I now see that I'm going to get a transit line, or I'm going to get a street improvement, or I'm getting something else. I will tax myself. And oh, by the way, if the federal government can make sure that happens sooner, that's the partnership. And I think that's the conversation we need to have both here in Washington, but also in our respective state legislators and local governments. Uh, Sam. Uh oh. <laughs> um, you know, over the past couple of weeks, most of my waking hours, unfortunately, have been spent in a room with the president's skinny budget. Yes. Which I'm sure everyone's aware. Um, the skinny cuts. To, 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 very skinny. Uh, it has major cuts to the community development block grants, to the tiger grants, to choice neighborhoods, all sorts of federal programs that support this work. So. I mean, given that we all agree that this stuff makes sense in a, in a conservative frame, that so many of these are common sense principles, I wonder, uh, what are the positive signs 
that you all are seeing out of this administration, or at least what are the areas in which you're still hopeful out of this administration, the new Congress, um, for federal support, federal partnership, and this kind of work that we're all doing? Uh, you want to start? Okay. Um, I think there's consistency um, that you know, the, the Tiger grants, the New Starts um, grants, are urban focused places. They're also cuts for essential air services, which are rural places, um, long distance Amtrak, which is generally supportive for more rural places. So um, even though I think the impact on cities and urban places is going to be more dramatic because it's just larger programs, um, I think that there's, this is what I mean about the, de there is a, there's an ideology here that's, that's being dragged through um, and it's hitting all of these different programs. So I think that's, that's some, certainly something that's worth keeping in mind as we think about well, what kind of reforms can we possibly get done. Um, let me stop there before I, before I regret the next one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will go nowhere to that, but I will uh, provide some comments. Um, thank God for three branches of government. And not in a negative way, just thank God for it. Um, because it's an honest lesson. And also you, I think one of the things we, you know, how does a bill become a bill, right? You found out like, what's the relationship between government? The president did release a budget. But we have to also remind ourselves that this administration is not fully staffed. So the main uh, initial uh, appointees were individuals who had an ideological for this government. The staffers were actually responsible for figuring out how to run government and make sure communities are actually running functionally haven't gotten there yet. So yes, the first thing you saw was a very skinny budget, right? Um, you also saw a Congress that's dominated by one party. I mean, you can literally ignore every Twitter handle from Democrats and focus all on those Republicans who come from very conservative states who all said this is not ever going to happen. Now, what's the issue there? What's the disconnect? There's no disconnect. Everyone understands from Wyoming, understands that we're really thankful that California, Florida, and New York pay more taxes so that I, who don't pay many federal taxes, can get some dollars to make economic development, clean up the Superfund, keep Yosemite clean, all those things. Amtrak, right? Like, all those things are important to me. Thank you for those other states. So I think there's a, a, a question of, like, we are our family, so I just I, I do, as a country, we work do work together. So there's that little disconnect. So thank God for multiple parts. What I do there, there is a conversation of consistency, though. Um, and I, I think Rob really pointed that out, that, yes, we should be thinking about who, what is the federal role in community development? Is there a way to structure a future tax code where we might get more money out of the private sector to invest in housing and other places and, you know, brownfield remediation that otherwise the federal government through its process couldn't do? Or is it that we can shift a lot of it to the private sector, but then the core functions of the state and the federal can take care of the really hard ones that the third private sector may never do? The problem was no one actually put that in a memo. No one said, oh, that's where our intent is. Um, after the budget was released, someone mentioned out of the OMB office that, oh, by the way, in three weeks, we will submit a government restructuring proposal, which I think may be an opportunity for them to go down that line. But I think it is a warning sign for all of us for what could the next four years be. Um, but I have to admit, Congress decides where the money goes. And if I'm a senator from Wyoming and I'm trying to do rural development, uh, guess what? Wyoming receives, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota receives a lot of transit dollars. It may not be a subway, but they have to bust around veterans. They have to bust around senior citizens who can't get around any other way by other than these rural transit dollars that comes from the federal government. And so I think once everyone has been digesting, they realize, oh, no, 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 government's good when it actually helps my people. And I think that's the reality that we have to be very truthful about. And that's okay. If it's a good and people, Americans need to hear that, that yes, this rural transit problem is, but what happens is that we always talk about this stuff in dollar amounts, $100 billion. What the hell is it going, right? If it's saying it's helping my great grandmother get from her house and with a nursing care to go to the hospital, that's great. I, could, my, I may support. I may give you money to do that. But otherwise, the way we talk about these issues is in dollar amounts. And I think that's what the budget actually created. And it created a dialogue of like what is really important. Now, what happens after that? Uh, I have to be honest. Most people are hoping just a regular CR, maybe the 2% cut. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's really where we are right now. 
Um, I want to kick it down to the end of the table as that skinny budget bore a striking resemblance somehow <laughs> to a product of the Heritage Foundation. Hi, Mike. And so, well, you may not. It's those uh, who got hired. You know, uh, you, know you, you certainly do not speak for everything, but you may be able to uh, shed some light on the environment in which you see producing these things. Sure. So, so uh, I mean, to, to your question, um, those, I have not read the budget. I don't know the details of it. But those aspects I like. Um, to go to what I said, my initial remarks, federal funding of local priorities creates an externality, right? So if you're an economist, if you are someone who's serious about making efficient decisions, not maximizing political votes, or which is what senators want to do, right? Uh, or not uh, maximizing the total number of public goods produced. If you're serious about efficiency, then this is a good thing. Cut these things at the federal level, let the states provide them if they want. Um, the federal government is running ever-increasing deficits despite economic growth. Um, that is a, a klaxon to uh, a fiscal economist, right? It's fine to run deficits in a recession, um, but if you're running deficits that are actually increasing your debt to GDP ratio in good times, you are in a bad, bad place. If you also happen to have 30 years of your parents retiring coming up um, and promises that you've made to uh, all the folks who are who are a generation older than you and I, um, you don't have fiscal flexibility to keep basically giving people things and telling them they don't have to pay for them, right? So most states are recipient states because it's a deficit-funded system. Um, so that makes it really hard to cut. It's politically uh, very attractive. It's the federal government will borrow money at very low rates, mm -hmm. and um, you'll get to pay for these things without actually. Or you'll, you'll get these things without having to pay for them. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that, well, rates are so low, so therefore it's a good time to, to um, you know, borrow, and this is, this is tremendous, these things have no cost. Um, but that's not true because the, you still have to pay back the principal, um, and rates aren't going to stay low forever. So uh, unless you have, you know, if you're talking about a specific budget item that has a return that gets you your principal back in dollars, then great. But if what you're doing is consuming it by buying nice things for your citizens, that's not an investment. That is consumption, and you're borrowing to fund consumption. And um, yes. Yeah, this is actually great, because this gets us to one of the things that you talked about in your article, Chris. Yeah, um, that that we do have to find a way to pay for these things, and we cannot you know, uh, keep on shifting these loads. And one of the issues that's been brought up with the uh, Trump uh, $1 trillion uh, plan is the use of tax credits. To me, this is taking a bazooka when you need a fly swatter. That, in essence, rather than give away tax credits uh, that has an internal rate of return expectation of, you know, 12, 15, 18, 25 percent, if you're going to take those tax credits, what we need is 3 percent debt money to pay for the infrastructure. We don't need expensive equity. We need cheap debt and sources of repayment of that cheap debt. Um, the other thing that I, I want to talk about is the uh, you know the very high cost of these systems, not, both the capital costs, which are outrageous, but also the operating costs. One of the things that we have to really get through our thick heads is that there are more effective ways of running a railroad, literally. And to take the example here in D.C. that we have a tremendous capacity challenge with Metro. Either we have to start building more tunnels at cost of you know, many, many tens of billions of dollars, or we run the existing assets more efficiently. I live <clears throat> in a 110-year-old building that has, a, has the last manually, operated, uh, last manually operated elevator in the city. It's very cute. It's very nice. We love it to death. It's inefficient as hell. <laughs> and yet we still have manually operated trains. Why aren't we moving to automated trains? Paris has done this on two lines in the last five years. Without the loss of one job, it increases the capacity by 40 or 50 percent because you have closer headways and decreases the cost by 40 or 50 percent because it's, it's, it's a robot. And you don't have to send all the trains back at night to a giant yard. You just, they just stop at 2 a.m. They stop in a station. Um, 
it makes infinite sense, and yet you can't bring this up without being crucified. Right. I mean, I bring I mean, it up. DC's metro is less automated than it was when it was built. Exactly. Yeah. This is mad. Well, and also, can I just touch about this? Is that um, you know. It, it, it requires us also to think about our infrastructure in just a different light. Um, and I, I totally agree, right, in the sense of we should be very fiscally res responsible how we dole out dollars and also not fail investing in ourselves or taking care of those who have already invested into the system. But one of the, the things to Chris, your last point is I remember one of my first couple of months in my, my gig as uh, the private sector voice around uh, uh, Walker River Development and uh, someone sent me a link and the link was to a video of what a, t a town in Germany uh, was doing with transit and it, literally the heading was uh, Christopher, new way to pay for transit. And I was like, okay. And literally, it basically was a light rail system. I was like, I don't understand. So I kept watching, kept watching. And you know what I realized I was watching? There was no one on the train. And literally what I was seeing was the fact this particular light rail system was being used by the manufacturing industrial businesses in the community to ship supply. I sent that one to you. I did. <laughs> I, did. I was hoping it'd catch on. And it's like, a VW you know. plant that was using exactly. the light rail tracks and, for, and, for and what delivery. What was really interesting was that if you are in one of the biggest challenges now of having this major demand for walkable urban development is the fact that you can't really, if you're Walmart, Target, or a lot of businesses, it's very hard to get your items into the city or into a lot of these major mega, mega regions. Um, because you now have to downsize, you have to have a distribution center, it costs more cost, da, 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 da. Well, we built these systems that are literally intersecting in a neighborhood, whether underground or above ground, and we're not utilizing to their fullest extent. And how, imagine how much Urban money we policy. spend yep. on trucking. How much could, in terms of just costs, labor, congestion, gas, congestion, but congestion and, and just the pollution. sheer fact of pollution. Imagine if you shifted that, those dollars, and put it into a revenue stream for transit in of itself. Now, I had a conversation with some folks at WMATA and uh, with some folks in uh, New York City. I said, wouldn't it be an interesting idea where you convince the federal government to get off your freaking backs and give you the authorization to maybe work with Google? work with some of these other manufacturers trying to figure out on-demand you know delivery systems you might have a new revenue stream now you may actually figure out a way where you don't have to charge people every year a new uh, fare rate those are new ideas that we need to be introducing in a conversation about how do we use the built environment more efficiently so yeah whoever that person sent me that email i just wanted to let everyone know we're still trying to make it happen Right. I think we are running on our time, and so I want to thank all of our panelists once again. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And if uh, I just want to emphasize that if infrastructure is going to be done well and the built environment is going to be well served in the next 30 years, it is going to be coming from ideas like the ones you just heard here. So keep paying attention. Thank you. <laughs>